All right, I think we'll get started. We're waiting for a few um, people who are making their way in, but, um, but uh, we'll get started so that we stay on time. We have a very full uh, agenda of things to talk about today. My name is Sarah Eggers, and I am at the Food and Drug Administration Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Where you'll hear CEDAR a lot today. That's what that stands for. I'm in the Office of Strategic Programs, and it is my great pleasure to be the facilitator of today's meeting. It's wonderful to see you all here today, particularly uh, the individuals with autism and the self-advocates self and family members of individuals with autism. I want to welcome you to our patient-focused drug development meeting on autism. Uh, Alice Unger will provide some opening remarks in a few minutes, but first let me start by asking my colleagues sitting up here in the front to state their names and where you are from in the agency. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ellis Unger, and I'm the director of what's called Office of Drug Evaluation One. And Office Drug Evaluation One oversees the Division of Psychiatry Products. My name is Dr. Mitch Mathis. I'm the director of the Division of Psychiatry Products. So uh, our division regulates the medications that are approved to treat psychiatric illness. Um, Tiffany Farshoni, I am the Deputy Director of the Division of Psychiatry Products. Julia Ture, Senior Policy Advisor in Psychiatry Products. I'm Ebony Deshiel Ajay. I'm a reviewer with the Clinical Outcome Assessment Staff in the Office of New Drugs in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. I'm Carrie Gilley, and I'm a medical officer within the Division of Gastroenterology and Inborn Air Products. Thank you. Um. Uh, Graham Thompson from the Office of Strategic Programs. Vegeta Vida from the Office of Strategic Programs. Okay. All right. We have a, a very full agenda today. Uh, so. We're going to spend a few minutes first with some presentations by my colleagues at FDA to um, set the context, I'll give an overview of patient-focused drug development, of autism, of clinical trial endpoints and why that's important to our discussion today, and then I'll come back up and give an overview of our discussion format so you know what to expect as we have our conversation today. Our two main discussion topics are the health effects and the impacts of autism. And then topic two will focus on your experiences and perspectives on current approaches to managing autism. We have set a time side for open public comment later this afternoon. While our primary discussion is focused dialogue with individuals with autism and their families, the open public comment gives anyone an, an opportunity to make a comment. To participate in that, you'll need to sign up. It's first come, first serve. The sign up's at the registration table. We'll close that registration at the end of the break or after we reach uh, 15 commenters. The time allowed for each speaker will depend on the number of participants who sign up, and it will likely be around two minutes each. Okay. As I mentioned, there's no kiosk today with food, but we do have the vending machines, uh, and we have coffee out in the front. I hear it's all, it's all caffeinated coffee. And if anyone does need food, please find um, one of our team members who can help you um, locate food in our cafeteria. The restrooms are located in the back of this. They're about as far away as you can be in the building. So they're, they're at the far hallway in the back and then to the right, and you'll find those there. We will take a break at about 3 o'clock, but we encourage you to get up at any point, um, to get up for any reason. Please feel free to do so. We do have a quiet room that is located outside the hall and behind us here. So feel free to use that room at any time um, if you need to. And we'll ask you now to silence your phones. The meeting's being transcribed, and there'll be a live webcast being recorded. So I do want to take the opportunity to thank the people who are, many people who are joining us um, through the web today. We will ask for your participation as well. So both the transcript and the webcast will be archived on our website. And with that, um, are there any other logistic? I think, I think those are all the key things I need to say now, so I will turn it over to Ellis to give some welcome remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, we're the, we're the Food and Drug Administration, and we really should be able to find food. So 
I don't quite understand that, but if you have trouble, you talk to Sarah. And if you're transcribing this, so be it. <clears throat> okay, again, good afternoon to everyone and welcome to this patient-focused drug development meeting on autism. And as I mentioned a minute ago, my name is Ellis Unger. I'm director of the Office of Drug Evaluation One, and Drug Evaluation One includes psychiatry, which regulates the treatment, uh, excuse me, regulates uh, drugs for the treatment of, of uh, psychiatric conditions and also uh, drugs that might assist in managing autism. And on behalf of my colleagues, I want to extend uh, my appreciation for the individuals uh, with autism and families who are here in the room and also I know there are a number of people who will be on the webcast um, and I'd like to thank all of you for being a part of the meeting uh, and sharing your experiences uh, with us. And uh, we really uh, look, look forward to uh, sharing uh, an opportunity to engage directly with you and we want to learn about aspects of autism that matter most to your child or uh, to you um, and types of things that make an impact in your daily lives or to your child's daily life. And we want to learn about what's important to you when you think about potential treatments uh, that could address some of the health effects of autism. Dr. Tiffany Farchione uh, is uh, <clears throat> on my right. It's from the Division of Psychiatric, excuse me, the Division of Psychiatry Products, and she'll provide a, a bit more background on autism in a few minutes. Um, we understand that autism is, is complex uh, and it affects individuals in different ways um, with different physical, emotional, and social impacts. And many individuals with autism uh, require medical treatments to help manage certain aspects of their condition. And where medical treatments are concerned, it's our responsibility here at FDA uh, to help develop new drugs that matter to people. That's what we do. And I understand we have many people from industry here, academia and other government partners joining us uh, to listen. Uh, and some are here in the room today, some are uh, probably on, on the web. And uh, I have a, a few messages I'd like to convey. Um, first, although we play a critical role in, in drug development at the FDA, uh, you might be surprised to learn uh, that we don't actually do clinical trials at the FDA. A lot of people think we do. Um, that's, that's a misnomer. Uh, clinical research is a lot of hard work, and we work with companies and researchers uh, and patient communities to help design the drug trials to establish uh, that drugs are effective and safe. We don't actually do the trials here. Um, we approve drugs only when we have scientific evidence that uh, they help patients feel better or function better. That's kind of the rule that we live by. And then once we make that determination, then we have to uh, make a decision in terms of whether the benefits outweigh the risks. But what we need to know from you is what you value in your daily lives. Basically, what, what matters to you? Uh, what, would, what, would, what would give us a clue that you feel better or function better? Um, and how one might measure that in a drug study? Um, so we want to hear what people with autism and, and their families care about. We want to hear how individuals and families think about the benefits and risks of potential uh, treatments to manage autism. And we want to hear how uh, to develop better ways to measure how well a treatment addresses the aspects of autism that are important uh, to people in the room. And then we look forward to incorporating what we learn through the meeting in, in, in terms of accelerating and facilitating drug development in, in this area. So once again, we, we thank you for your contributions to this meeting. And I think that having this type of dialogue uh, that we expect to have today is extremely valuable for, for us and for others, and we're grateful to each of you um, for being here to share your personal stories. I know some of them are, are, could be difficult, um, and we want to hear your experiences and perspectives. And now I'll turn it over to uh, Pajita Vidaya, who will provide some background on the uh, patient-focused drug development efforts in general. Thank you. Thank you, Ellis. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank you all for coming today to participate in our patient-focused drug development um, meeting. We're here today to hear from you. But before that, I'd like to give a brief overview on the patient-focused drug development initiative that we started five years ago. FDA recognizes that people living with a condition have a direct stake in the outcome of drug development. And they are experts in what it's like to live with the condition. 
people living with the condition are uniquely positioned to tell us about the benefits that would be, be most meaningful to, uh, to them, the things that bother them the most, and perspex, perspectives on overall condition. And this information can then inform the drug development and drug evaluation. Through the Patient-Focused Drug Development Initiative, FDA is developing a more systematic way of gathering patient perspective on their condition and treatment options. This input can help inform the collective understanding of the therapeutic context of drug, de drug development, which is important to our role, FDA, as, as regulators, and the role of developers and others throughout the drug development process. As part of the Patient-Focused Drug Development Initiative, FDA is convening 24 meetings in a five-year five -year period, each meeting focused on a specific condition or a group of conditions. Here's a quick overview of the list of the disease-specific meetings we have focused on in the past few years. In the five-year time frame, you can see that we have tried to cover a broad range of conditions, which include several rare diseases, conditions that are chronic, that are symptomatic or have loss of functioning, that might affect functioning and affect the different subgroups as well. One of the main outputs of, the, of these patient-focused meetings is a report, which is called the Voice of the Patient Report, that captures the patient input faithfully and, and exactly in, um, in your own words, in the participants' own words. We take what we hear from you at these meetings, things that we hear from the webcast and um, through the written docket, and we summarize that, and hoping that we are able to capture this exactly the way that you have um, expressed it to us today here. We see this as a useful reference tool for us, as it can support FDA staff um, as they conduct benefit risk assessments for products under review, or when advising drug sponsors on their drug development programs. We also believe these meetings can have value to drug development more broadly by helping to identify areas of unmet need, such as aspects of, of patients' conditions that is not currently being addressed in current therapies. This input may also help developers um, as they identify or create tools used to measure the benefit of potential therapies. And finally, we have seen the potential in these patient-focused meetings to help raise awareness within the um, community as well. So I hope this gives you a brief and better understanding of our program. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Tiffany Farcioni, who will give a brief overview of the condition. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, and again, as everyone is saying, thank you guys for, for being here today. Um, we wouldn't be able to do this without all of you who are, who are here in the room and the folks who are um, listening online. So um, for me, I'm going to be talking just a little bit about um, the actual diagnosis of autism itself. So talking about what it is, um, who might be at risk for autism, uh, what the clinical manifestations are, um, give you a little bit of an idea of some of the um, demographics, the current treatment options, and some of the challenges in terms of drug development for autism spectrum disorder. Um, so what I'm going to focus on is just the, the current diagnostic criteria, as um, I'm sure a lot of you guys in the room know that um, criteria recently changed in the transition from DSM-4 to DSM-5. So I'm going to just focus on the current um, diagnostic criteria. So um, in order to receive a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, an individual has to have persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction across multiple contexts. So this includes things like um, deficits in social reciprocity and nonverbal communication, so like trouble with eye contact or um, trouble interpreting body language. Uh, they also have trouble developing, um, maintaining, or understanding interpersonal relationships. Um, with regards to restrictive and repetitive patterns of, of behavior and interest, um, this would include things like uh, stereotyped behaviors, um, insistence on sameness, uh, restricted interests, and, um, and sometimes you get either hyper or hypo uh, reactivity to sensory input. So these are 
Um, I think about, uh, so by way of background, I'm a child psychiatrist, so I think back to um, patients that I have where the uh, parents would come in and complain that, you know, my, my son can't stand to have a tag on the back of his shirt, and I have to cut all the tags out of his clothing because if it even touches him, he can't stand it. So that would be like um, hyper-reactivity. That, that would be an example of hyper-reactivity to um, sensory input. So um, other things that are on the list of diagnostic criteria, you know, obviously the, um, the symptoms have to be present in early development. Most often, um, you know, usually uh, this gets recognized in the second year of life, um, although, you know, delays in diagnosis are not uncommon. Uh, the symptoms cause clinically significant impairment in functioning. Now, this is kind of the um, criteria that cuts across all um, diagnoses in the DSM. If it doesn't impair your functioning, then it doesn't get counted as a disorder in the book, right? Um, and then there can't be a better explanation by something else, whether it's intellectual disability or some other global developmental delay. You know, if, you, if there's some other explanation, then you don't call it autism. Um, so what are the risk factors for, for this? We don't know what causes autism, what um, makes one person one way and what makes another person another way. We don't know why some people are more severely impacted and others are not. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, it's very likely that there's multiple causes because there's probably multiple types of autism spectrum disorder. Um, there could be environmental, biologic, genetic factors. All of these things are likely to play a role. So, for instance, somebody who has a sibling on the spectrum is um, at higher risk of being on the spectrum themselves. So that speaks to the genetic factors. Um, there are certain um, genetic or chromosomal conditions where autism is more common, like fragile X or tuberous sclerosis. And, um, you know, in terms of other biologic factors, children born to older parents are at greater risk for having ASD. So those are just a few examples of things we know so far, um, but there is still a lot that we don't know. Um, as far as, you know, if you have a, a person with autism sitting in the room in front of you, what is that? How are, you, how are you going to know? How are you going to recognize that? So I've got a long laundry list, two slides worth of things that you might notice. So um, in little kids, some of the first things that you might notice are that um, you know, your child is not pointing to the things that he or she wants. Um, they might not look at an object when another person points at it. Trouble relating to others, trouble playing with other kids, um, not making eye contact, wanting to be alone. All of these things are um, part of the, the overall clinical picture. So, and then a few other things, um, not being interested in, in people, or having trouble, um, having trouble pretending. There's a, and then again, like I was saying earlier, some of the manifestations like repeating actions over and, and over again, or um, you know, really restricted range of interest to where like, you know, you can't change the conversation from one topic to another because the person with autism is is stuck on the one the one topic. So. Um, you know, but when you look at this and you see that there's this broad range of things, you realize it, it, it's sort of a preview for a couple slides from now when I talk about the difficulty in, in developing treatments, right? Because um, what do you target? So uh, just to let you know an idea of how common this is, um, I know that this is, well, I mean, the screens are really big, so I guess it's not as small as I thought it was going to be. But um, one of the things that has been um, an issue is that it seems as though the prevalence is increasing. You know, and there's always been this argument, like, is the prevalence actually increasing, or are people recognizing it more, are we over, you know, what's going on? Nobody really knows, but at least in the last, um, the last two surveillance periods, it seems that things have stabilized. So the, um, the, in, the prevalence is still, can, you know, it's one, incidence, rather, is one in 60 eight children. So that is a lot of people with autism. And again, because it's a spectrum, you know, the, the, the level of impairment or the level of functioning will vary 
greatly across all of those individuals. So what do we do about this? Um, as of right now, there are no FDA-approved drugs um, to treat the core symptoms of autism. So, you know, the things as far as the social communication issues or the um, repetitive behaviors and things like that, there's, there's nothing. We don't have anything approved for, for those features. Um, what we do have are um, drugs that are approved for the treatment of irritability associated with autism. And, you know, that it's still a piece of the picture that can be very impairing, um, but it's not, it's not the core of, of the condition. So the mainstay of treatment at this point actually is, is behavioral therapy. Um, things like applied behavior analysis, the early start Denver model. Um, there are a number of different approaches. We don't regulate any of those, so, um, uh, so I can't really speak too much further to that, but again, like the behavioral interventions are the main, the main treatment right now. But there are a lot of challenges to, you know, developing a drug to treat an aspect of autism or autism writ large. Um, the, one of the biggest ones is that we just, you know, the pathophysiology of, of autism is unknown. So this means that we don't, like, we don't know what, you know, so like, so for instance, if you, if somebody says that you've had a heart attack, like, you know that there was a clot that went to one of those tiny vessels in your heart and it blocked it and then part of the heart died. So that's the pathophysiology of a, of a heart attack, right? So we don't know what the mechanism is behind autism. And so if you don't know what the mechanism is, it's hard to figure out how you target that for treatment um, or for prevention even. And we don't know, you know, there's probably lots of different causes for what leads to um, autism spectrum disorder. We also don't know what the best endpoints are for, for clinical trials. You know, there are a lot of different um, diagnostic rating scales. Um, but if you are able to find a treatment that actually makes a change or improves something, we don't know how sensitive those diagnostic scales are for measuring change. Um, you know, we don't, we don't have, um, we don't have good scales in order to say like, okay, well, we're going to look at this or we're going to look at that. So you end up with sort of a piecemeal approach like, well, I'm going to look at social communication and there's this rating scale for social communication and there's this rating scale for repetitive behaviors and we're going to kind of cobble it together and see if we can come up with an endpoint. And then on top of that, we're going to get like a global assessment to say, well, just, you know, sort of general idea, are patients doing better? And a lot of that is, um, difficult to translate into a, a clinical trial. We also don't know how long it takes before you see a meaningful change. So say, for instance, you find something that works, that really helps to, for instance, um, you know, decrease the number of repetitive behaviors, and a person is now able to um, function better out in the world and have better social interaction. How long does it take before that happens? You know, and if you don't know how long it takes before you're going to see that happen, you don't know how long your clinical trial needs to be, you don't know at what point you need to assess the end point, you don't know whether, you know, maybe there might be early signs that you could have an earlier end point in the trial. So it makes it very challenging. And we also don't know, like, is there a, a, a window where you can intervene and make a difference? So if there's a, a way to treat um, to, to affect change in a child, is that going to have the same effect on an adult whose, you know, brain is fully developed and, and all of those things? We, these are things that we don't know. And the other big question is where along the spectrum, where along the spectrum do you actually need to intervene? You know, because you have one end of the spectrum where folks are severely impaired and, you know, have um, like totally nonverbal intellectual impairments, unable to live on their own, will always require assistance. On the other end of the spectrum, you have folks who are very high functioning, 
and you know hold down great jobs and can have a life and a family and all of these things and then you have everything in between so at what point along that line would you actually say well maybe we ought to do something about this like maybe we need a medication to treat that and that's part of what we're going to be talking about today because we're well aware that you know there are folks who are at this end of the spectrum where they're doing pretty well they don't need a drug you know they're doing all right but folks at this end of the spectrum are going to need some help so where along that line do we do we intervene so just brought over to you the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder has been increasing in the United States um, even though it appears to have stabilized like I was saying we don't have any drugs approved at this point but you know I think that speaks to the unmet medical need that we have here and there are a lot of challenges that I've just outlined and that we're hoping that you know through some of the feedback that we get from you guys today maybe you can help answer some of those those questions for us All right. and then up next is Ebony and she's going to talk a little bit more about um, the endpoint issue that I had previously mentioned Good afternoon, everyone. So today I'm going to take you on a brief journey down the road from patient-focused drug development public meetings to clinical study endpoints. Here's a general disclaimer that the views that are expressed in this presentation are my own. So you may be wondering, how is the information from these PFDD meetings used? Where do we go from here and how do we take this valuable insight and create clinically relevant patient-focused endpoints for clinical studies? At the FDA, we believe that PFDD meetings are very important. They provide the opportunity for individuals and caregivers' voices to be heard. For instance, in the case of today's meeting, individuals and caregivers can share their experiences with the health effects of autism in their own words letting us know what symptoms and impacts are most important to them. And drug companies want to know this perspective because it can give them ideas about what should be measured in their clinical studies. They can then select and develop questionnaires that measure these important concepts and engage with the FDA as they develop treatments. The information from these meetings can also help support the FDA's review of clinical trial questionnaires to confirm that they adequately capture the individuals and caregivers' perspectives on health outcomes. While the PFDD meetings provide useful information, we strongly recommend that drug companies and researchers obtain additional input from individuals and caregivers through focus groups, one-on-one -on -one interviews, as well as engage experts and other physicians when they develop their questionnaires. And this will help confirm that the questionnaires include important and relevant content and that the questions and instructions are clear and understandable by those who will complete them. Another advantage of these meetings is that they help us think about clinical study endpoints. So what's an endpoint? In the case of questionnaires, the study endpoint would be how the questionnaire score is going to be measured and analyzed in the clinical study. For example, if individuals with autism or their caregivers are reporting that the most important treatment benefit is symptom improvement, then we would use that information to encourage the drug company to select or develop a symptom questionnaire that meets regulatory standards. The study endpoint could possibly be the change in the questionnaire score during the clinical study, which would measure the amount of symptom improvement. I should note that many important things are discussed during these PFDD meetings. However, not everything will change with treatment, and it would be difficult to interpret results if these concepts are measured within the clinical setting of drug approval. So since we focus on efficacy and safety at the FDA, a concept like financial well-being, for example, may not be impacted by treatment in a clinical trial setting, even though it may be important to individuals and caregivers. So we encourage drug companies to consider focusing on important concepts that are most likely to reflect the effects of treatment as their main key study endpoints. If financial well-being is measured, however, in a trial, 
we would suggest that it instead be designated as a supportive exploratory endpoint. At the FDA, we have to uphold laws and regulations. And within these regulations, there are regulatory standards that require us to ensure that assessments like questionnaires generate responses that are well-defined and reliable and are not potentially false or misleading when described in labeling. To ensure this, we ask that drug companies gather input from individuals and caregivers through those one-on-one -on -one interviews and focus groups to develop the questionnaires. We also ask them to perform the appropriate statistical testing to support questionnaire development. These methods help demonstrate that the questionnaires measure the right thing in the right way and that the score is accurate and reliable so that any positive score changes can be interpreted as symptom improvement due to the treatment. Now, we recommend that drug companies engage with the FDA early and often when they're developing questionnaires. So how does the FDA engage with drug companies? We currently have three pathways to provide advice to those interested in using questionnaires or what we call clinical outcome assessments in clinical studies. The first pathway is within the context of an individual drug development program. Through this mechanism, we encourage drug companies to begin discussions about their questionnaires as early as the pre-IND phase to ensure that there is enough time for questionnaire development before their phase three clinical studies. The second pathway is within our drug development tool or DDT qualification program outside of the IND pathway where we can work with questionnaire developers to create and qualify questionnaires that meet unmet public health needs and can be used publicly across multiple drug development programs. The third and final pathway is through the critical path innovation meeting process where a questionnaire developer or drug company can discuss and receive general feedback from the FDA on a clinical outcome assessment in the early phase of development outside of the individual drug development program. So I want to leave you with a few key takeaways. The first takeaway is that PFDD meetings are a starting point for developing patient-focused outcome measures and endpoints. The second is that outcomes of PFDD meetings will support and guide FDA risk benefit assessments in drug reviews. And lastly, individual and caregiver input ultimately helps determine what is measured to provide evidence of treatment benefit, how best to measure concepts in a clinical study, and what a meaningful improvement is in treatment benefit. So that concludes my presentation. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Eggers. Thank you to my colleagues for the background uh, demonstrating the complexity of the condition and drug development uh, for treatments. Now I'm the only thing that's standing between us and what we really are here for, which is dialogue with individuals and family members today. And to do that, I want to um, give a few, um, a few opening, a few descriptions of what our meeting looks like today. So, going the wrong way. So, as I mentioned at the start of the meeting, and I know some of you have come in after the opening, so I'm going to go through this again so we're all on the same page. The, we have two topics that we are looking to cover today. One is on the health effects and the daily impacts of autism, and the second is on the current approaches to treatments. And for the first topic that we'll cover, we're really interested in looking about what are health effects that are most challenging for you or your child, if you're um, the parent of a, of a child with autism. How do the health effects Im impact your, your or your child's daily life? And how are those experiences with autism changing over time? When we think about the current approaches for treatment, we're looking at what are you or your child currently doing to, um, to manage your autism? Uh, what are the goals for the treatment? How well are those treatments meeting your goals? And what would you consider to be a meaningful benefit of any treatment? Understanding this allows us to understand better the things that Ebony and Tiffany were saying about the types of things that, that um, drugs and medical treatment should be targeting and the things we should be looking for in terms of improvement. 
And then what are the th key things you think about when deciding whether to start or stop a new treatment? This meeting is quite different from other public meetings that you may have attended. Our intent is really to foster open dialogue on personal experiences and perspectives on, on autism. So on each of these topics, we're first going to kick off with a panel of individuals and family members. And I would like to ask the, um, the people who are speaking on topic one, the panelists, to come up and take, and take a seat at this point. So the purpose of the panel discussion uh, and comments is really to set a good foundation to kick off our discussion by providing a brief snapshot of six different experiences with autism. And some of these individuals are also affiliated with support advocacy or research organizations. They've all prepared remarks and I thank you very much for the effort in, in putting forth. And I also want to thank the effort, um, those of you who submitted comments and su and expressed interest in participating in the panel. We weren't able to, um, to select everyone, but your comments sent to us are really important because they help us prepare for this meeting and they provide insight. And if you submitted comments at any point to our inbox, to our email, uh, we suggest, we recommend that you submit those comments in their full form to our public docket, which is a website, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Okay. So after each of the panel discussions, so after um, you give your remarks, then we'll move out and have a facilitated discussion with all of the individuals and family members in the room. And the purpose here is to build on what we heard from the panel members to get a sense from you what is generally similar and what might be different in your experiences and your perspectives from what you heard. So I'll ask a number of follow-up questions and my colleagues from FDA will also um, ask any questions that you like. To do so, we will have our team floating around with microphones uh, to bring the microphone to you so you don't need to stand up at all. Uh, just raise your hand if you um, have an answer to the question that's being asked. We're going to ask that you state your first name and just your first name is fine before speaking. And for the sake of transparency, we also request that at the time of your first comment that you disclose if you have an affiliation with an organization that has an issue, interest in issues related to autism or if your travel here today has been funded, or if you have significant financial interests in any autism drug development. So as we move through this, this discussion, we're going to navigate through various perspectives. There are three main perspectives that we'll hear today. Um, we'll hear from parents who are caring for children. We'll hear from parents who are caring for adults. And we'll hear from self-advocates, the individuals with autism. Each of you will have your own perspective and your own experiences. We're going to try to navigate through that fluidly. There'll be times when I ask a question specific to one of you, um, but we ask that each, when you speak, just to remind us or to give us um, um, a brief description of what category you're falling in, whether you're a parent of a young child or a child, parent of an adult, or a self-advocate. Okay. And to keep, we ask as we, to make this discussion efficient, We'll be asking questions, and please stay on the topic of that question that was asked and keep your response to a minute. We, we really want to make sure that we get to everyone who has something to contribute today. If we don't get, if you don't get to fully say what you want, that's what the docket, and I'll get to that. You'll, you'll be able to provide us additional comments later. Um, I'm going to try to, to um, and the, the microphone, the folks with the microphone will try to keep and allow everyone to get a chance to speak. A few other things. We have some polling questions, and so if you've been wondering what those little disks are in front of you, they are our very fancy clickers. Uh, we will be asking questions from time to time. We're going to ask that individuals with aut autism and a family member or a family member um, who is answering, thinking about a child or children with autism uh, use the polling questions. These are not a scientific um, survey at all. Uh, the, the purpose is to aid in our discussion to see what kinds of, of perspectives and experiences are, are shared by those in the room. So in person, you'll use these disks, um, the clickers. You'll know if your clicker, you're going to see your, there's going to be a question and then an answer will be A, B, C, D, E. You click what's what's most appropriate. Sometimes you only click one thing, and sometimes you get to click more than one thing. You should hear a little or feel a little buzz if, you, if it has captured your click. If it doesn't, raise your hand, and we will come and help you. 
Uh, and on the web, um, we very much value your participation. And these, the polling questions are a chance for you also to contribute as well. Um, so the same polling questions are asked of you. And there you'll just um, answer in the, you know, with your mouse. If you have any problems, um, type in the comment box and someone will help you. And if you're on the web, you can also add comments through the webcast. You can type um, your comments. Uh, although they might not all be read today, they are captured. We will summarize them and they'll be included into our summary report. And we will also try to go to the phones to give you another opportunity to contribute. And information about the phone um, uh, will be made available through the webcast. Okay. So I've been talking about the docket. It is a fancy federal term for a way to send comments to any regulatory agency uh, through a website. Um, so we call it the public docket. This docket will be open for two months following the meeting, so it will close on July 5th. And any time you can send multiple comments if something else comes to mind, you can send in comments. If you know there are people who couldn't make it today, whether you signed up or they didn't sign up, or you know people who you think really have something important to contribute, encourage them to participate and send us comments through the docket. Um, and if you thought of something today, um, it comes to, my, come to your mind, send it along. You can visit these slides. By the way, these slides will be posted on our website following the meeting. And so you'll be able to visit this link. Or you can go to www.regulations.gov and search on Autism FDA. And there you will find it. There's a Comment Now button you can click. Um, if you have any problems, email us through the email that you have received communications from us. Okay. There are a couple other resources at FDA. Just want to point you to if this if if you're if you become or are interested in topics related to FDA and drug development and drug review. If you're an individual and family, I would suggest your first stop is our FDA Office of Health Constituent Affairs. They run the patient network and patient representative program, so you can contribute your voice that way. And for advocacy and support and healthcare providers, a first stop for you might be CEDAR, that's the drug evaluation, uh, professional affairs and stakeholder engagement, or we call it PACE. Uh, they facilitate cl collaboration and communication between um, the FDA experts and, um, and stakeholders on issues in drug development, review, and safety. And I also want to put a plug on May 12th, if you're interested in, in this topic, um, there's a workshop called Roadmap to Engaging with CEDAR. You can Google Roadmap in CEDAR and you should be able to find that right away. And if you have any questions, again, email us. We're not, um, our office isn't running that meeting. It's, uh, I believe, PACE is. Um, but we can definitely point you in the right direction. Okay. So there are a few, um, um, a few rules we'd like to put out um, to make sure that our meeting is as effective, fair, and open as possible. And and I'll start with encouraging all family members and individuals to contribute to the dialogue. Whether you have a name tag or not, we don't know if we have name tags for everyone. If you are an, a self-advocate or a family member, we want to hear from you and we encourage you to contribute. Everyone else, we're asking you to stay in listening mode. There is that open public comment period for you to contribute if you would like to. FDA is also here to listen. Uh, they'll ask some follow-up questions. You may have questions on your mind for FDA. We may not be able to address questions as much as we would like today, but if you do have a question, write it down on your evaluation form that you'll find, or write it down on a slip of paper and send it to us, or email us, and we will figure out a way to answer your question. The discussion will focus on the two topics I mentioned, the, the autism health effects and the treatments. And there, what we will not focus on much today are, are the specific causes of autism, or issues as much re with regard to the healthcare system in general. We will be focusing as much as we can on what FDA, what's in, within our mandate and, and mission to think about. It is imperative to understand that the views expressed today are personal opinions. And not only are they personal opinions, they're very personal, very sensitive topics that we'll be covering today. And 
and it is a lot. We know it's a lot for you to come and speak today, and we, you can know that everyone in the room respects that, um, and if you're typing in on the web, the same. We have respect for everyone and everyone's perspective. We know that we have people who are wearing different hats, and they have different experiences with autism, and so we just want to make sure that respect for one another is paramount. Okay. Finally, let us know how the meeting went today. At the end of the meeting, evaluation forms are available at the registration table. They are very much um, important to us. Although we've conducted, I think, 22 of these meetings, we learn every single meeting how we can do better, and so we value your input. With that, we are ready to get into some polling questions. Uh, so, the, so I'll ask those of you in the, in the room to get your clickers. So we start with, we start with probably the easiest one we have, which is where do you live? So if you live within the Washington, D.C. metro area, we'll ask you to click A. And if you came from outside the D.C. area, we'll ask you to click B. Any challenges with the clickers? Just raise your hand and we'll come to you. Okay. All right. You're oh, up here. This is not this is this is a question okay if you don't if you don't um, get a chance to answer. So can we I'm getting some buzz that we might have some difficulties with the polling question. So maybe it's all of us that are having the problems. And OK. You know what? I'm going to suggest that we will figure out the, we will figure out the panel, uh, the, the polling questions, or we won't. And we're going to move on right now just to hear why we're really here is to hear your stories. So we're going to go through. So, Sorry about all of the screens. We'll just go through and ask um, Nadine to start and say your comment, and then we'll move through the line with your comments, and then we'll, then we'll see where the polling um, went. So when you comment, please uh, push the red button. Bring that microphone as close to you as you can, um, the red button at the bottom. And um, when you're done, uh, we'll move on to the next, and, and you can click off your red comment. Yes. Nope, just press once. So we'll see how named Dina. Oh. Do I come up to the podium? Or do nope, I stay you're going to stay there and, and, and give your comments. Good afternoon. My name is Nadine Morris, and I'm here to share information about my life with autism. My daughter Anna was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder two and a half years ago when she was three. Anna has a lot of classic signs of autism. One of the signs is being kept on daily routines. For instance, she has to have the same lunch every day. Two pieces of pumpkin bread, go-go squeeze brand plain applesauce, and animal strawberry yogurt smoothie. If this or any normal activities change, she will have difficulties adjusting throughout the day. Additionally, transitioning from one task to another can be difficult for her. It is not only necessary for me to give her adequate notice before we can change tasks, but how I actually communicate that notice to her is just as important. For instance, before we leave the park, I have to ask her, Anna, how many minutes until it's time to go? She responds to me with the time, and then I respond that I'm setting an alarm for that many minutes. So when the alarm goes off, she's able to stop what she's doing and transition without any issues. However, if I do not ask her to give me a time and instead of say to her, we're leaving in five minutes, She's totally thrown off, and I'm facing a major meltdown. Socializing is another challenge for Anna. Although she has far exceeded the expectations for developing her expressive language skills, any random conversations can be similar to that of a toddler and usually lacks a common interest. She also tends to be socially awkward. She'll point at a person who she's talking to, jump up and down, and flap her hands, especially when she's overly excited. The social aspect, aspect is one of my biggest fears as a parent. Will she be able to function in kindergarten and beyond? Will she be bullied for being, quote unquote, different? And how will that affect her? She also displays high levels of anxiety. She becomes obsessed with objects like a toy and cannot be without it. 
I have had to drive back home when she has forgotten it because I know that without it, she will have a bad day. She's also obsessed with events in her life, like taking a bath or going somewhere. She has to constantly be reassured of when exactly that event is going to occur. Additionally, she has difficulty staying asleep. She'll wake up multiple times a night, start making unpleasant methodical noises, and then proceed to rock back and forth and bang her head until I come and comfort her. The sleep deprivation was causing a lot of impulse, impulsive and negative comments, or I'm sorry, behaviors, I apologize. Therefore, I started letting her sleep with me about a year ago. The restless nights and negative behaviors have since stopped. The rocking and banging of her head is also something she does to self-regulate her emotions. It gives her the sensory stimulation that she needs, which leads to another sign of autism, sensory processing disorder. Sensory processing disorder is a huge umbrella term for behaviors that are associated with senses. For Anna, it means she has a lot of fears. She used to be afraid of crowds, even to the point where the local pharmacist would actually bring my medications outside to my car because she, wait, she couldn't even approach the store without screaming. But over the years, I have worked relentlessly on this, and she's grown accustomed to being in public places. Additionally, she is frightened by the hand dryers and the, the flushing toilets in public restrooms. That makes it very difficult for her to be out in public for an extended period of time. She also has a difficult time eating and trying new foods because she may not like the taste or the texture. The sensory processing disorder also makes her a very huggable person who loves to be tickled constantly. Even with all the symptoms, autism has become our new normal. I have had to make changes in my approach with her, ensuring her a calm and patient environment. I've reinforced good behavior and identified her triggers. But we, and we have worked together over the years and both have made progress in adapting to both old and new situations and environments. I was also fortunate enough to get her started in county's early intervention services when she was two and a half years old. These services and a group of amazing teachers have also done well in molding Amanda, uh, my daughter's name is Anna, into the amazing child that she is today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nadine. Um, before we move on to Zoe, I just want to ask the, the feedback that we hear up in front. Um, this is a, we're in a new setup here, so we we will be addressing that if we can. Can I? Do you hear feedback in the back of the room? Okay. So my apologies to those of us in the front of the room about feedback. So, so why don't we, um, okay. we will next have Zoe. Zoe. Sorry about that. I thought if we were taking a break to address the feedback, I might as well bring my headphones up. Um, thank you so much for having me on this panel. My name is Zoe Gross. I'm autistic, and I'm the director of operations at Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. We represent a community of autistic self-advocates with a broad range of disability experiences. So people with and without intellectual disabilities, people who speak and people who don't, people who need daily support and people who don't. I want to say right off the bat that when I talk about self-advocacy, that isn't limited to people who work for nonprofits. A self-advocate is someone who has preferences and has access to any way to make those preferences known. And any discussion of the needs of autistic people needs to center self-advocates with all kinds of experiences. I'm really glad that the FDA is interested in patient perspectives, but we must be careful not to treat autistic perspectives as interchangeable with the perspectives of our loved ones. In order to get a good range of autistic perspectives, we would need far more self-advocates participating than we have here today. I want to make sure that we begin with a framework that prioritizes supporting autistic people and improving our quality of life. So we should talk about what quality of life looks like for autistic people and question any assumptions that we might be bringing to the table. For example, the number of times I made eye contact today is not a valid measurement of my quality of life, but it is a trait of autism that many interventions target. We need to make sure that when we talk about problems, we are talking about things that are problems for the autistic people who are experiencing the things, not simply things that make us look different or that inconvenience others. The fact that something is a trait of autism doesn't mean it is a problem in someone's life. A lot of people have tried to develop medical interventions that target repetitive behavior, for example, like flapping your hands or pacing. Um, we might call this stimming. Um, but stimming doesn't cause us problems. It often helps us focus and interact with the world around us. So a medication or other treatment targeted at reducing stimming might make us appear more normal, 
but it wouldn't improve our lives. It might cause us new problems. We strongly discourage drug development that targets this type of behavior. Even if something is both a trait of autism and a problem in someone's life, that still doesn't necessarily mean that it is an appropriate target for medical intervention. For example, some autistic people struggle with self-injury or aggression. These are serious problems in people's lives. In some cases, self-injury or aggression can represent an attempt to communicate that something is wrong or can be a response to physical pain. If these needs are not evaluated, giving someone a medication to stop them from self-injuring may leave underlying needs unaddressed. Autism is not an illness or a disease. It is a developmental disability. Even things like self-injury and aggression are often best handled with supports other than medication. It's also important to note that a lot of the really difficult medical or, difficult or disability experiences that autistic people have are not caused by autism, but by co-occurring conditions. Some of these can include anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, insomnia, connective tissue disorders, and seizures. We need more research into the interactions between autism and these disabilities, and more research into whether best practices for treating conditions like anxiety and epilepsy are working for autistic people. For example, autistic people are more likely to have seizures, and therefore more likely to be prescribed anticonvulsants. But autistic people are excluded from trials of anticonvulsants. We know that in some cases, autistic people may react to medications differently, so the lack of research and data on this is a big problem. But it's important when we talk about how best to improve autistic people's quality of life that we remember that things like seizures and insomnia are not caused by autism and would not be impacted by a medical intervention that targets what we think of as core autism features. Thank you again for having me, and I look forward very much to our discussion. Thank you very much, Zoe. For those of you that have been on the panel, if um, the feedback bothers you at any point, feel free to go back to the table and be part of the conversation then. And now we'll move to Cheryl, please. Hello. I have three offspring diagnosed with autism, a daughter 24 years old and two sons 22 and 19. Each presents quite differently, but their greatest challenge is trying to achieve and maintain a healthy immune system. For almost two decades, they've done blood work about every six weeks to monitor their immune markers. And whenever their immune systems have improved, they've likewise shown dramatic improvements in their ability to speak, focus, learn, and maintain self-control in public. They are much happier. All three of my children have experienced issues with speech and communication, environmental and food allergies, reduced blood flow in the brain as documented through neurospect scans, reduced ability to fight infection due to low natural killer cells, inflammation as shown through chronically elevated eosinophils and ferritin levels, years of elevated group A streptococcus bacteria as measured via ASO testing, and reactivation of one or more human herpes viruses, HHV, as evidenced by highly elevated IgG antibodies. I'm concerned about high human herpes virus IgGs because this opportunistic virus family, which is in the same group of double-strand DNA viruses as smallpox and adenovirus, has been associated with organ transplant rejection, cancers, multiple sclerosis, and many other illnesses. My daughter's unique immune symptoms are best described by her diagnoses. As an infant, she had issues with bilirubin, thrush, cradle cap, latching, and a large head due to fluid buildup outside her skull. She could she could speak words clearly at six months, but quickly lost each new word, very likely due to a seizure disorder finally diagnosed years later. As a toddler, she could still speak some words, but her speaking voice became less and less clear, and she demonstrated significant auditory processing issues. Both of these conditions may be connected to the middle ear drainage problem that we now know affects her hearing. She also began demonstrating some of the obsessive compulsive behaviors which continue to plague her to varying degrees. In recent years, her anti-nuclear antibodies have often been positive, indicating autoimmune issues. She has also been diagnosed with nodes on her thyroid, calcifications on a pelvic cyst, endometriosis, and a genetic mutation linked to susceptibility to multiple cancers. Her communication remains at a basic level. My older son's unique immune symptoms are best described by numbers. At one and a half, he whined most of the time, yet had no discernible speech. At age two, he understood everything said to him, yet lived in his own world. At age three and a half, he became gluten-free and for the first time in his life was able to tolerate being held or bathed. 
At age four, he went dairy-free and also began an antiviral medicine, the latter because he had high HHV6 IgGs and because his alpha interferon level, indicating his body was fighting a virus, was 1,100, 100 times the normal level. The next day, he slept through the night for just the second time in his life. At age four and a half, he stopped having diarrhea on a nearly daily basis after starting treatment with a now defunct immune modulator. He spent eight years from ages six to 14 taking an antibiotic to reduce his group A streptococcus titers from a high of over 2,400, 12 times the normal level, down to 172. Only 30 days later, his strep titers shot up tenfold to almost 1,800 due to his exposure to a person with strep and some inconsistent antibiotic administration. Soon after that, he became extremely violent toward property, himself, and others, a situation which continues when he's in poor immune health. Currently, after eight and a half more years of antibiotic treatment, his strep titers are down in the 400s, a thickened heart valve resulting from strep-related rheumatic fever has repaired itself, and he seems to have stopped his most violent behaviors. However, he remains mostly nonverbal, and his ongoing immune issues have left him unavailable for learning. My youngest son's unique immune symptoms are best described by his gains. After losing all speech at 11 months, he regained it at age two, right after going off dairy. He lost speech again a few months later, but regained it once again at age two and a half after starting an antiviral protocol to target his high HHV titers. As a toddler, he couldn't comprehend facial expressions or understand another person's mental perspective. But by elementary school, after his immune health improved, he was able to use movies and conversation to develop these skills. Diagnosed with a visual tracking disorder that made reading a challenge, he just received his associate's degree with a B average and starts a four-year college this fall. Restrictions on activities because of symptoms? When one of my older two children's immune markers are bad, our family's focus is forced to center around dealing with that person's increase in aggression or disruptive behaviors. Our best days are family vacations where everyone is able to go. Our worst days are family vacations where my older son is too aggressive to go and gets left behind with a parent. Conditions, symptoms that have changed over time? My two oldest children have always had little ability to communicate through speech or devices, as well as issues with self-control. But these problems have improved or deteriorated in near direct correlation to how well their immune systems are doing. And our biggest worry about our children's condition, with their complicated health issues and minimal communication skills, I dread the day my oldest two children have to move to a group living environment. A healthy immune system is their vector to an engaged life, but I see no immune modulating treatments on the horizon. Thank you very much, Cheryl. And now we have Tom. Hi, thanks for inviting me today. Uh, that's my son, Sean. Uh, he's 13 now. Uh, I want to note that I am an employee of Autism Speaks, but I'm really here today to give three perspectives, I hope. Uh, my own as a parent of Sean, uh, and hopefully I can give some of his perspective. He is nonverbal, so it's not always clear what his perspective is, but um, hopefully I can give some of that. And I'd also like to give uh, you some of the responses that we received to the survey that was sent out from uh, our family advisory committee in the Autism Speaks Autism Treatment Network. So um, my son struggles with communication all day, every day, um, from the moment he wakes up to the moment he goes to bed. Uh, he's nonverbal, and even expressing basic wants and needs is quite a challenge for him. He uses a speech generating device, and he carries it with him most of the day. Uh, but he's not very fluent with it, uh, at least not yet, and uh, he prefers to use other less effective means like tapping us or sometimes pushing us. Um, this causes a lot of problems in understanding him, as you can imagine, and it certainly causes a lot of problems in interacting with him. Uh, from his perspective, I have to believe that this is incredibly frustrating for him. It's really hard for him to get across what his wants and needs are in any kind of efficient way. I'm certain that at times he feels like we're not trying to understand him. Um, and that, of course, is difficult for him and, of, and dis difficult for me, my wife, and his younger sister. Uh, it has led him over, over the course of his life to isolating himself more and engaging less in social interactions, uh, both within the family and, of course, outside the family. Uh, so communication is really our major struggle, and it's his major struggle. Um, on the survey, our family advisory committee noted challenging behavior, communication, sleep difficulties, and of course, co-occurring co conditions like GI problems, seizures, 
uh, etc., as being some of the biggest concerns that they face. Uh, as a result of my son's autism and the cognitive intellectual difficulties that he has, he's not independent in, in most tasks, including basic daily living skills. He really needs a lot of prompting to engage in or complete tasks. And again, it seems to me that it's frustrating for him because he becomes very reliant on us, and I think he would like to have more independence than he can uh, achieve uh, at this point. Um, he d just as one example, he doesn't like to get helped in showering or bathing, but obviously these are pretty core things that need to get done every day uh, or almost every day, and uh, so that can be quite a struggle and a fight between us. Uh, on the survey questions, parents from our advisory committee noted social interaction as being the, the most frequent activity listed where their children could not fully engage with their peers or with other important people they wanted to interact with. And I wanted to just uh, sort of end with noting that while my experience uh, and our family's experience, my son's experience, and then the experience of the parents on our survey was that the difficulties that I'm describing do improve over time that they tend to remain significant. And on the worst days, they cause significant distress. Um, for my son, this often manifests as challenging behavior, uh, sometimes kicking or pushing. Um, uh, uh, he's six foot tall, so when he kicks, it's not trivial. Um, he can feel very frustrated if he's not able to communicate or he's not being understood, as I mentioned. And uh, I don't think he wants to be physical. I don't think he's interested in hurting anyone. Uh, but the, th this sort of pattern in our family definitely leads to a loss of quality of life. It certainly affects uh, his younger sister uh, when she gets caught up in it. Along with sleep difficulties um, uh, and the challenging behavior and the communication difficulties, um, my son has a history of many of the problems that have been described uh, from GI to immune-related problems, and um, those also periodically affect his functioning and certainly his well-being. Um, on our parent survey, it was noted that uh, on the worst days, some of the parents' children need constant supervision, which was extremely difficult for both them and their children with autism, and it really limits the child's feeling of independence or the adolescent, in some cases, the adult's feeling of independence. Um, I would just finish by adding that my main worry as my son gets older is his ability to transition to a supported living environment and also to some kind of meaningful vocational placement. Um, and on the survey that we sent out, uh, the parents noted concerns about education, living, and vocation and work were, were the, really the major worries for parents. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And now we'll have Sarah. Um, hi, my name is Sarah. Uh, disclosure, I work for the Association of University Centers on Disabilities, or AUCD. While I will be referencing a webinar that I helped produce with them, the following comments are my own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of my employer. Um, so I'm an autistic adult, and I would consider the most difficult uh, issue I face with that uh, to be a co-occurring condition. Um, I struggle with depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation. This is not uncommon for autistic people. 67% um, of adults with Asperger syndrome, which has now been folded into autism spectrum disorder, reported suicidal thoughts, and 35% reported having specific plans or attempting in one study in, from 2016 in Lancet Psychiatry. Um, in another study, 14% of autistic children under 16 talked about or attempted suicide compared to 0.5% of children in the general population. Additionally, autistic children who reported bullying were three times more likely to consider or attempt suicide than autistic children who did not report bullying. 60% of the autistic children in the study reported bullying, and that was a study from the journal Autism in 2012. Um, in the last year alone, three of my friends in the autistic community have attempted suicide. I myself attempted in 2014 after being fired from my first full-time job after two weeks for being a bad cultural fit. Uh, in retrospect, this most likely means I did something socially inappropriate without even realizing it. Um, I did some interviews with other autistic adults for a webinar I did with the Association of University Centers on Disabilities called Suicide Screening and Prevention in the Autism Community, New Developments and New Perspectives for Autism Researchers and Professionals and talk to them about some of the barriers faced in terms of getting treatment and care. Um, you can find that archived on the, you can find the archive webinar on the AUCD website if you're interested. Um, I think that there needs to be more focused patient-centered research on autism and its relationship to anxiety and depression. 
Right now, the majority of drug treatment is centered on reducing behaviors. What that means in practice is that drug treatment for autism is centered on making us more manageable for non-autistic caregivers. This is the primary purpose of prescribing things like Haldol or Risperdal and other, and other heavy antipsychotics to children. Um, it's essentially a chemical straitjacket. Instead, treatment should be focused on reducing our anxiety and depression and on increasing our quality of life, life as a whole. This means that we need to have better access to care. Getting a psychiatrist who understands both mental health and developmental disability issues is a struggle. Finding someone who's competent in both and treats adults is basically impossible. Um, and even if someone does treat both, they often don't take insurance. Anecdotally, autistic people, additionally, an additional issue is that anecdotally, autistic people seem to be more sensitive and respond atypically to many medications. Um, so the lack of specialized knowledge and research is particularly damaging and unhelpful. Um, we also need a holistic approach to improving our lives with focus on employment, education access, and anti-bullying efforts. Um, while having more drug research is extremely important, uh, I want to remind everyone that drugs alone won't, won't solve the problem, because, uh, but drugs should be included in a way that's consent-driven, research-oriented, and most of all, patient-centered. We are autonomous people from our parents and often have different goals and needs than they do, like any other children and parents, and that needs to be respected. Thank you very much, Sarah. And finally, we have Kylie. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Kylie Law. Uh, like many of you in the room, I wear many hats in the autism community, both professionally and personally. Uh, by training, I'm a physician and a researcher. Um, I work with the Interactive Autism Network and Spark for Autism. Um, my everyday work is focused on engaging our community as key decision makers in autism research. Uh, the reason I'm here today is that I am the mom of a young adult with autism, and I wanted to share our family's story. My son Isaac, now 24, was diagnosed with autism in 1996. He was three years old. Um, I am not going to say much about the early years, except that they were rough. Um, I am going to focus on how Isaac is doing as a young adult. Isaac is somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. He is fully verbal, and at the age of 20, he was able to receive his high school diploma. He qualifies for residential and employment support services through the Maryland uh, Developmental Disabilities Administration. He lives in agency-provided housing with one housemate and part-time staff. To date, he has not been able to find a job that is a good fit for him. Isaac's biggest challenge today is related to his dual diagnosis of autism and bipolar disorder. He received the second diagnosis at age 15. He is not alone. We know from research that between 54 and 70 percent of people with autism also have one or more other mental health conditions. During adolescence, Isaac developed severe depression. He became withdrawn, sad, and fearful. At times, he was afraid of sleeping by himself. He also had thoughts of wanting to hurt himself, his siblings, and me and his dad. Um, Isaac has also been extremely manic. He has run away from home. He has tried to flag down uh, drivers in the middle of the road to take him to the airport. And he has been picked up twice by the police. He has been hospitalized two times in the last three years for problems related to his mood disorder. We have struggled to find mental health providers who are familiar with adults with autism and with mood disorders. We have struggled to find effective, effective treatments. At one point, Isaac was on five different psychoactive medications at the same time. Now he is fairly stable on two. Uh, we have also tried many different types of supportive therapy. Ultimately, 
art therapy has been the best fit for Isaac. Another problem related to Isaac's autism, and now also his mood disorder, is the significant difficulties he has with falling and staying asleep. Uh, sleep has always been a problem for Isaac, but I think now it's even a bigger problem because the poor sleep worsens his mood problems. Uh, the relationship between autism, mood disorders, and sleep disorders is complicated, and for our family, it's an important topic to figure out. Other challenges that are problematic for Isaac and that keep him uh, from achieving his best include um, slow processing speed and poor working memory. He also has difficulties understanding social, social situations and he has uh, problems with sensory sensitivity. All of these challenges make employment and independent living very difficult for him. I wanted to end by saying a few positive things. It's always hard being a mom up here and saying the, talking about the problems. Um, first, despite many challenges, Isaac at times has been much easier to, to parent than his three siblings who are tweens and teens and who don't, do not have autism. Um, Isaac loves science fiction and space opera. He's taught me the terms multiverse and FTL, which means faster than light, in case you didn't know. Isaac can replay full movies in his head. And he is the only person I know who has a favorite theoretical physicist. And finally, I want to end by sharing some of Isaac's own words. Um, I always ask his permission before I talk about him. Um, and so when I was t told him I was speaking today, this is what he said. Mom, you know I disagree with you and the doctors about autism and bipolar. I do not like those labels. I am just a quirky, oddball kind of guy who likes to do things his own way. Thank you so, thank you so much, Kylie. Um, I would like to ask a round of applause for those of you who have given comments. And I'm also going to invite you to go back to the tables because if the feedback is less back there, as you were saying, take your tent cards with you um, if we have questions. Um, so while they're doing that, I just want to also um, um, touch upon one thing, which is the topics are sensitive that we're talking about today. And one of the topics that we have heard about and will talk about is suicide ideation. And just want to rem remind you to seek any help um, if you need it. Uh, the suicide prevention, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline um, is, is there. We have the information. Um, we'll put it up on the screen uh, at the break. And um, um, just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. So I'm going to see if I can get this microphone to work. It might take me a second. Hello? 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 Does this work? Can you hear me? Great. All right, so we hope that we um, identified a range of, of speakers that, um, that demonstrate the range of perspectives that we received in from the comments and we hope reflect the range of experiences that, um, that you, that the individuals with autism and family members experience. With a show of hands, did you hear one or more things that really resonated with you and your family's experience? Okay, all right. Then we've learned a lot already, and we want to build on that now. There's a couple things we won't touch upon as much in this first topic, and that will be on the treatment approaches. We know that some of the panel speakers mentioned that, but we're, we're going to focus on health effects and impacts on daily life first. And so 
Um, and I also want to remind us that as we move through the discussion, we're going to try to navigate those various perspectives that we have as parents of younger children or children, parents of adults, and the self-advocates in the room. Um, we didn't get to we didn't get to ask the polling question on this, but if everyone feels comfortable just to raise your hand, can I ask, I'm going to ask if you, whether you fit into one of these, um, whether you wear one of those hats. Uh, so if you don't feel comfortable, don't raise your hand. But if you are a parent of uh, a child under, under 21 uh, or multiple children, can you raise your hand? If you're a parent of a child or children who are say, older than 21, that's family member. I'm sorry, family member. I should be, yes, family members. And if you are a self-advocate, an autistic individual, raise your hand. OK. All right. So we have, um, we have all three perspectives um, represented in the room. And oh, I can't move? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to stand right here. All right. I move a lot. <laughs> These are new microphones. We're going to go. Don't move, don't move your hand. Don't move my hand. Okay. All right. I can do this. Uh, anyway, as you answer, try to let us know which of those hats you're wearing. Okay. So we're going to start with a polling question. And these polling questions are never perfectly worded, but what we're trying to get at is a sense of where you may find your experiences and perspectives. So as to answer this polling, and, and we'll see if it works. Um, I hope this works. The polling question is trying to get at what health effects of autism are most challenging for you or your loved one, if you're the, if you're the family member of a loved one. And you can choose up to three health effects. A is irritability or disruptive behaviors. B is cognitive impairment. C is social impairments. D, communication difficulties. E, repetitive behaviors. F, sleep issues. G, depression or anxiety. H, gastrointestinal symptoms. Or I, a health effect that's not up here. Okay, I'm not seeing any responses going up, so you can just don't worry about don't worry about answering the, the polling questions. Um, you don't want to waste your your times or your or your or your thumbs to try to do that. So what we will do is um, start with some that we've heard about and get your thoughts on them, and then we'll go to other to other um, effects. So let's start with the first one, which would be irritability or disruptive behaviors. We heard, we heard some of that mentioned up above. But what we're looking now is, is for you to share if, if that would have been one of your top concerns about autism in your life, life of your child. Let's hear a little bit about why that is so. Sarah? We do have quite a number of responses on the webcast. OK, can we hear those responses? Um, so we had 60% of people um, responding irritability or disruptive behaviors, 40% on cognitive impairment, 55% on social impairment, 66% on communication difficulties, and roughly 30 to 35% for the rest of them. OK, OK. So, so then. Following up on the on A here, irritability or disruptive behaviors, and we have Jeannie. And hold the I guess we all need to hold the microphones really close. Just focusing on irritability and disruptive behaviors. Is that good? I'm so Just focusing on irritability yeah. and disruptive behavior. Let's not say irritability. That's really underscoring what we're okay. you know, underplaying what many parents are dealing with. Our children are suffering, and nothing isolates them more in our society than physical aggression toward others. And also, it's terrifying for a parent to see a child self-injurious. But these, we're talking physical, really, the irritability, you know, we can live with it. But you know, destructive, aggressive behaviors, isolate them, cost a huge amount to society, 
um, you can't go out anywhere. I mean, you, hey, you're not invited over to the neighbor's barbecue. Um, I, yeah, so I, you know, I effectively treated my daughter's uh, aggression. I can talk about that later. But I talked to so many of my friends with children who are severely affected with autism, suffering is how I like to differentiate. They're suffering with their autism. And this is the biggest problem okay. is the aggression and self injurious behavior and destru destruction, uh, destruction of household items and stuff. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, so I, heard, I saw head nods as Jeannie was saying that it's not irritability that we're, that's most concerning to us. It's the aggression and, disrupt, and, um, and disruptive behaviors. Um, does that resonate with you? Okay, still head nods. So then with those terms in mind, anyone else want to follow up on what Jeannie has to say? Back there with uh, Sarah and Kit. Um, hi, I'm Sarah, and I'm an autistic self-advocate. And I, I just want to say I think that the separation between irritability and disruptive behaviors and depression and anxiety is a little bit artificial. Um, I think that irritable, irritability or disruptive behaviors are often just an expression of depression or anxiety, especially in people who might have more communication difficulties. Thank you. You know, I think we can wait till break. And, and did you get it working? It's working. Do you want to do the polling question? Okay, let's do the polling question then. Um, the health effects of autism. Um, in that category as well. So if you didn't get, in, if you didn't have time to do all of your three, that that's okay. It gives us a sense uh, that we should have started with communication difficulties in our round of questioning here, uh, because that is what um, most of you in the room um, have indicated, and and about very similar for several other things, with the exception of the repetitive behaviors. That's that's not as concerning for many of you in the room here today. You also have indicated a lot of other health effects. We heard about the co-occurring health effects mentioned. We might not get into those as much today, but we'll try to save time to get into other health effects. So Kit made this point about the behavior means something else is challenging. And you mentioned communication difficulties. So let's follow up on that and hear a bit more about the role the, the impact that the communication difficulties have. And, and brief but specific examples would be very helpful. Anyone like to follow up? Okay, we'll go with Cheryl. 
my older child that I spoke of, my older son that I spoke of before, his sole way of communicating is to tap his chest once for no and twice for yes. And he can't use communication devices. He has them. Just something won't let him. And um, when he feels better, he does start using words. But most mm -hmm. of the time, that's what we have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? We'll go here. Hi, I'm Stuart Spellman. I'm with Autism Speaks, and I'm the parent of a 22-year-old with autism. My son is not verbal, and he has an intellectual disability. Uh, communication is a continuing challenge. Uh, my wife and I um, often uh, have to guess um, what, what Zach is trying to uh, communicate. Uh, one of the issues that comes up a lot is, is the everyday issue of uh, the bathroom. Does Zach have to go to the bathroom or not? He signs when he has to go to the bathroom, but sometimes he signs, he uses the same sign to, um, to sort of go away from a situation. We don't know if he really has to go to the bathroom or if he's bored, if he's at a restaurant and uh, mm -hmm. he's finished eating and my wife and I have not. So uh, obviously this is a... Um, uh, important social behavior. Um, we have, you know, we have to be mindful. We, we want to make sure that uh, he doesn't have an accident. So this is mm -hmm. uh, a continuing challenge. Okay, thank you very much. Um, anyone else? Right back there. Um. I, I hope I can convey my story the way I want it. Uh, bear with me. So I have a 10-year-old daughter who's uh, on the spectrum. Uh, he's not, she's not very severe. However, she's also, you know, uh, as you know, um, autism for girls, the ratio is lower than boys. But most girls tend to have more severe uh, um, symptoms, but luckily she's, I think she stays somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. Um, so since she's in fifth grade now, um, we, she got her diagnosis when she was three and a half, and I realized one problem years ago, and I'm hoping that I can do my little part to broadcasting this. So one, one phase I had was, I believe she can learn. She is smart in some ways. She was actually um, you know, placed on this code called uh, intellectual disability by the uh, public school. By the way, it's a long story. We moved because of her. I quit my industry job and moved to Maryland to join FDA because, you know, here I believe we have more resources for her. And my son, uh, you know, also moved with us uh, to come here to attend uh, high school. I always believed that uh, she is educatable and she, if she can overcome that, uh, you know, speech language hurdle, she can be taught for many things. And I always believed in that. However, uh, the assessment, the numerous assessments done by the school, at the end, do you think uh, she is uh, the best program that uh, fits her need is what they call, uh, what was that? Uh, learning, LFI, learning for independence. To put in uh, a plain language, basically, you know, they put her off the diploma track and this is a certificated track, so basically, you know, they teach her basics of learning skills. And I was, uh, you know, I disagreed with that. So what happened was um, I put her in a private special educational school. When she entered uh, third, uh, I'm sorry, fourth grade, from fourth, a uh, third going to fourth. And she was eight years old at that time. So I said, no time to waste anymore. This child has to be placed in a small setting. Two to one, that's what we got for her. So we'll be talking um, um, 
more management approaches. But let me ask you a question. What is of her communication challenges? And, and what's, your, you, what's your name? Oh, my, I'm sorry. This Ping. Ping? Yeah. Okay. Um, what is the biggest difficulty with communication that you have with her on a day-to-day -day basis, say, trying to um, help her in her daily in her daily routines. Is there a, the most significant communication challenge that you can say? Uh, you know, I don't know how to uh, describe it precisely, but it evolves over the years. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, it was the, even the basics. But later on, you know, I, that's how I realized, you know, if you're a patient, for example, uh, I spent six months teaching her the concept of wait. Wait. wait for your turn. And once that, once she got that, you know, everybody's life is changed. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when a person doesn't understand the waiting, you know, she needs it. She needs it now. You know, ev you know she's screaming and, uh, you know, uh, whining. But once she realizes, you know, she can wait and she can get what she wants. And that way she pleases everyone. I think she, by now, she's the, one of the most okay. patient person you know, that I have ever met. She can wait for me for a long time for certain things that right. she really wants. Hey, so, thank you very much. That was, that was an excellent example. And as we all think about the ways that we can convey to our FDA colleagues specific ways that, um, oh, okay. that these effects impact daily life, um, th that wait was a, was a great example. Can we have, uh, if any of the self-advocates are in, uh, feel comfortable talking about communication challenges or difficulties from your perspective? We'll take one comment and then we, we'll move on to, to some other effects. Okay, I'll take a stab at this. Okay. Keep in mind this is just my pers perspective and not necessarily the perspective of my organization. Uh, the I work for the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. Okay, so I can have trouble formulating exactly what I want to say. It's like there's a gap between what I want to say and what actually comes out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. Often what I end up saying is a sort of compromise between the block and, and what's, actually pos what's actually possible. I particularly... I'm an incredible writer, not so much great a speaker, and I've struggled getting my words out in speech for most of my life. Most of the people who know me well know me online because there I can be my full self. And I don't know if there's any kind of drug that could even fix this. It doesn't seem like something that could be treated in the usual sense, but I've often I've often thought about it and wondered if there was a cause or a source. I just don't think that a lot of the research into autism is going into what autistic people would actually want to know about their condition. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much, Kelly. Um, before we move away from communication, um, anything on the FDA panel that you'd like to ask a question about? Uh, Ebony? And talk really close to the microphone since we all have to do it. Really close. Um, so with regard to the impact of communication difficulties, I want to hear separately from the caregivers as well as individuals with autism. Is it the intensity or severity of these communication difficulties, the frequency or how often you experience these difficulties, or is it the context within which you experience these difficulties that has the most impact on your life? Is the question clear? We'll start with Nate. Uh, We'll start with Nadine, and then we'll go back there. Great. Hopefully, I'm answering this properly. Um, with my daughter, she does not necessarily have a problem with receptive communication, which means when you talk about anything she actually understands is the expressive part. And then um, she gets overwhelmed, and um, she doesn't know how to like actually say what she's trying to say, which is when she starts to try to stim. and. Um, and control her emotions. Am I, if I'm able to actually kind of intervene and say to her, what do you need from me or what can I help you with? Um, and actually with my own communication, I can't talk any more than this monotone. Even if I like, like lift my voice up a little bit, she actually 
feels that. Um, so I'll say, you know, what do you need? What can I do for you? And that's where um, she can sometimes barely get out in like broken, almost like broken English, like I can't zip my coat. And that's like how she communicates. But imagine at two years old or three years old when she was not in verbal, that was a scream and that was a, a ba banging her head or biting herself and that was her actually self-injuring herself. So the communication has become mm -hmm. much better because of that. Mm -hmm. But every single day we deal with this because she understands the things coming, out, coming in, but it's the coming out part is where she's having the most difficulties. Okay. And a lot of head nods on that. Yeah. Thanks, Nadine. And we'll go back here. Hi, I'm Montessa Lee and I'm not necessarily a caregiver, but I'm here on an education perspective because I taught in an autism program in our district and um, now I'm a mentor teacher, so I mentor teachers and, and some are working with um, students diagnosed with autism. So what we see on the outside, of, you know, so it might not necessarily be in home, but as far as communication difficulties is sometimes when they can't communicate what they want, it's manifested in behavior. Mm -hmm. And of course in a school, if you're aggressive or you know even assault an adult at times bite them or something like that it's because they can't communicate what they want and that's that's the manifestation the behavior and that could be problematic or, or seem to be problematic um, and until you know the student sometimes we really get to know the student and know their behaviors as um, Nadine was saying and we know what they're trying to express and so as she said, the frequency, it also depends on where they are on the spectrum. I've had kids that were verbal, but they couldn't necessarily express what they wanted in words or before they acted on a behavior, they couldn't express how they got there. You know, so that five point behavior rating scale that we get our, our um, emotional scale, no, I'm about to blow <laughs> my top, I'm angry. You know, so teaching them how to regulate that as well to communicate, hey, I need a break. Thank you very much. So can we do a show of hands? Oh, we'll come to you, Lynn. Uh, can we do a show of hands to say, now, you can tell me if this question doesn't work. But a show of hands to say, if you thought about the communication challenges and the communication difference, difficulties and all that comes because of it, the, the behavior and the frustration, is it a day-to-day -day constant that bothers your child the most, or is it the real big, intense, um, really striking communication challenges that happen maybe once in a while or less often? Is it more a constant, or are there times where it comes and then comes really strongly with a communication ch challenge and a, and a behavior that, that bothers you? Okay, let's go to Tom first, and then we'll come to you, Lynn, for whatever. I can be quick. Uh, it's frequency, intensity, and context for, okay. for, for me. Okay. I mean, I think, right. uh, uh, you know, it's really all of them. And I think measurement, this is we're sort of talking about measurement, and I'll put my science hat on for a second, and I'm a measurement person. So um, I think when we develop these instruments, we need to take all of these things into account rather than having very basic severity scales. Okay. Thank you, Tom. And you got a... Lots of head nods and even a few claps on that one. So, and now we'll go to Lynn, please. Yes, hi. Um, so uh, my name is uh, Lynn Durham. Um, I'm the sister of a person with autism and the mother of a child with autism. And um, I usually don't disclose that, but as a child, um, I was considered very high functioning on the spectrum. I no longer fit on the spectrum. Um, actually, um, your question about um, communication and irritability or disruptive behaviors kind of um, questioned um, different uh, perspectives. Um, uh, I just want to say English isn't my uh, primary language. Um, from my uh, own perspective as a child, um, I always had the feeling that um, and the frustration linked to the fact that I had the feeling I was communicating pretty easily, but I wasn't exactly saying uh, or um, passing out uh, what I wanted to say, and I always uh, felt a little bit like I, it didn't fit quite right. And that really echoes what um, I think you were saying earlier. 
And then um, when I um, look at my brother, who's a 37-year-old with autism, um, actually, um, for my brother and my son, uh, autism is a really a dynamic condition, um, a little bit like um, hypertension or diabetes. They really have those uh, ups and downs and good days and bad days, or rather good periods and bad periods. And um, during uh, good periods, um, when uh, their communication uh, improves um, on um, measurable, um, uh, in measurable ways, for example, mean length utterance of speech or um, uh, latency in response, for example, because that's how I, I, I evaluate, um, you know, the, the quality and the difference in their communication from dif between different periods. It's very different in my brother and in my son. Um, my brother is, um, I would say, in the middle functioning range. He has, uh, I hate IQs, but um, he has an IQ of about uh, 85. Um, and um, when um, he's in an up period um, and that uh, he feels more at ease um, in communicating, um, his level of uh, depression, measured level of depression goes down. So, uh, and he's less disruptive. Mm -hmm. um, in my son, um, it's uh, very strange, and I do uh, link uh, his communication difficulties with um, uh, difficulties, uh, I do link his uh, d behavior difficulties with uh, difficulties in communicating, but one, his uh, communication uh, level of functioning improves. Um, he um, actually can get more anxious. And uh, so there's a, there's a big variance between patients, and I think that um, the, the key thing to consider is that, um, of course, there's, there are core impairments in autism, but, um, and those core impairments are present in all patients, but to be able to measure, and that will take us probably to your next subject in endpoints, to be able to measure endpoints, you have to consider uh, patient individual uh, endpoints uh, with um, um, with measurable uh, uh, endpoints within a patient individual context. Okay, thank you. We'll go right here with Tom for one, and then um, we'll we'll move on. We are going to stop at at three o'clock for a break, even if we aren't quite finished with topic one, and then we'll come back. Okay. So Tom, well, here. I think I <laughs> just want to echo that. It may be slightly different circumstances. So our son. Uh, is 30, minimally verbal, uh, uh, minimal expressive uh, uh, ability. What we definitely, this, di this dynamic element that we really, yeah, that we really uh, struggle with, if he's having um, a, a hard time and we think he's trying to communicate something, uh, or I guess what I should say, he's more apt to be communicative if he's he presenting as less anxious. He's more apt to be less anxious if he's presenting as not stressed out by his environment. Um, you know, whether it's noise or, or whatever the case may be. And so it leaves us thinking, well, what is it that we need to treat here? Is it the communication issue? Is it the anxiety? Or is it the sensory overload? And, and it does. It varies. It ebbs and flows. Um, so uh, not making this any easier, I guess. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So you're raising important um, challenges. Um, as we go on. Before we go into break, let's go with one that received... Um, um, a lower number of, of responses in the room, repetitive behaviors. Uh, let's get some perspectives for those of you that maybe can we have someone who identified repetitive behaviors to describe it, um, describe that impact on life? Okay, that's it's okay. We'll go here with Kylie. Uh, yeah, so I would just say that. Um, Isaac has repetitive behaviors. He paces. Um, and, and for other people that aren't familiar with it, I guess they could be annoyed by it. But as a mom, it, it doesn't bother me. And when I ask him about it, it doesn't bother him. OK. OK. Any other thoughts on this? Um, so I, I have some repetitive behaviors. Um, some of them are ones I've had for my whole life, some are acquired from weird psych medication side effects. Um, I would say it's not a difficulty in my life, honestly. Um, I mean, it's a little weird. It gets weird looks. Um, but 
like just explaining it to people if they're good people usually they'll be really understanding and if they're not then I probably don't want to spend that much time with them anyway okay so show of hand we got a lot of nods in the room show of hands if if this perspective you think it if, if that's your perspective or you think that's perspective of your child and you okay so a resonating theme um, so then we won't spend oh, do you yes Tiffany please so I would I would just point out that that's actually something that is very enlightening for me sitting on this side of the table because we get a lot of folks who come in and say, oh, well, you know, we're going to use this endpoint and we're going to measure restricted repetitive behaviors and, you know, try to treat that. But looking at all of you, and I see all these shaking heads saying that, you know, this isn't really something that we care about. So um, that's, that's very, because, you know, we don't want to, to develop treatments for things that don't matter. And if it doesn't matter to you, if it's really something that's more of a problem for other people, maybe that's not the best thing to go after. We'll see if we're getting any web comments on the topic of this. And if you're on the web, please chime in as well about, about repetitive behavior. Before, um, before we go to the break then, because of this, is there any follow-up questions you want on, on the repetitive behavior? Uh, some, we had one more person. Well, let's let the um, gentleman in the green shirt go first. And then we'll uh, have Lynn, and then we'll go for a break. Okay, quick comment. Um, I am on the autism spectrum. I don't have a lot of repetitive behaviors at this point. But I have had things that were, um, I don't know, I felt like somewhat compulsive physical motions and stuff. And I don't think that the behaviors were necessarily a problem. But I would point out that sometimes there were things that I've done due to underlying physical discomfort and a sort of physical restlessness that is actually an unpleasant phenomenon. So mm -hmm. I wanted to just point out that the behavior may not be a problem, but sometimes what's driving it may not be the greatest thing to be dealing with. It could, should be assessed as a possible treatment target. Okay. So the underlying whatever is leading to the the behavior, the repetitive behavior, is something that is worthwhile to, to, um, to explore further. Okay, great. Uh, we'll go with Lynn, and then we'll take a break for 10 minutes. I'm sorry, I didn't want to speak that much, but there really was something I wanted to t say about mm -hmm. repetitive behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, from my m multiple experience, um, it's not really the repetitive behaviors that have been a problem. It's more the restricted uh, interests in the sense that um, in my um, brother for instance um, he won't uh, leave um, and the rigidity he won't leave um, uh, he won't go any further than um, uh, 20 miles uh, away from his house mm -hmm. um, and um, my son um, is uh, our his interests are so restricted that um, when we can't stay at the house for uh, on weekends for more than a half an hour because uh, he, he starts getting anxious because he doesn't know what to do and he doesn't know how to occupy himself. And so uh, even if it's raining, snowing, anything, we have to go out and uh, uh, take him to do sports activities because he doesn't, I, I don't really have the term um, um, to, to define this because it's really a feeling, but he doesn't really know what to do with his own skin, and so we just have to go out and, um, you know, offer him constant um, activity and occupation. So it's not re the repetitive behavior; it's the restricted uh, interest and uh, rigidity. Okay. Would anyone, um, in those of you that had the eye other health effects, would you have put what Lynn just described? Was that in your eye? Show of hands, please. Okay. No, there, so there are other things besides that. Okay. Let's take a break um, for 10 minutes, and we'll come back at about 3.12 and get started again. Um, or again, the restrooms are back there. We'll get started, and we'll see if there's any follow-up on here. And if we haven't fixed the feedback issues, I think we'll do the topic two panel comments from the tables because um, I think that's easier. So anyway, everyone come back to your seats um, in 10 minutes. Thanks. <laughs> 